Good afternoon, and welcome to the No BS Debate with two of the candidates for City Council District 9. We are your moderators. My name is De La Vaca. And I'm Sarah Moore. And we want to thank the candidates for coming out to represent their communities. We also want to thank the Denver Open Media, the Open Media Foundation, and Civic Matters for hosting this event. And lastly, we want to thank you, the audience, for participating in the democratic process. Yes. The debate rules go as follows. So as the moderators, we're going to ask each individual candidate questions on the topic of civil rights and related topics. Each candidate will have a minute and a half to answer, after which the other candidate will have an opportunity to rebut for one minute. The first candidate will have the opportunity to reply, and we encourage a lively debate, but we will interrupt if someone goes too long, okay? This debate is slated for 50 minutes, and as we draw into the last five minutes, we will end the debate and push into the lightning round. At that time, candidates, you will be asked to, you will be asked closed-ended questions, and you must answer in a concise fashion about your position with either a yes or a no, okay? Denver City Council District 9 is located in central Denver and serves the diverse neighborhoods of Aurora, Central Business District, City Park, City Park West, Clayton, Cole, Illyria, Swansea, Five Points, Globeville, Skyland, Union Station, and Whittier. The candidates for City Council District 9 are Jonathan Woodley, David, Anthony Oleski, Candy Sidabaka, and our incumbent, Albus Brooks. With us today are our incumbent, Albus Brooks, and we'll begin with you for your one and a half minute introduction. Great, thank you. Thanks to the moderators. Thanks for everybody who's uh, out there watching. My name is Albus Brooks. And I have been in the city for the last 20 years, uh, serving young people of color all over the city. Um, and it is an honor and a privilege uh, to serve this city. Um, and I have, I love the city so much uh, that I got married here and I've raised my three kids, uh, Makai, Kenya, and Kaya. Um, I got the opportunity to run for city council um, in 2011. And at that time, we had 38 challengers. Uh, and we ran on the campaign slogan of, man, connecting our diverse communities. And that's one of the things that we've been doing since we've been in office. We believe in an inclusive Denver, and we believe that we become an inclusive Denver through housing for all, through investing in our early childhood education and young people, and making sure that we invest in an equitable transit system. I'm excited to share with you my vision for an inclusive Denver, what we've done, and stepping boldly into what we'll do into the future. Thank you. Thank you. Candy. Good afternoon, my name is Candy Sedebaca. I'm a fifth generation native of District 9 in Denver, born and raised in Swansea, went to Swansea, Cole, and Manuel. I was a first generation high school graduate from Manuel and ended up being a Daniels Fund Scholar and being the first and youngest person to complete a dual degree at DU's Graduate School of Social Work. I'm a social worker, a community organizer, and a policy expert. I've spent almost two decades of my career working in and with government at the federal level, state level, and local level. For the last uh, five years, I've run a an organization that I started 13 years ago called Project Voice, which train employs and organizes underrepresented youth to insert their voice into policy. I'm running because I believe Denver's at a critical point right now. Our growth has brought a lot of amazing things, but we need to grow more responsibly, and I wanna bring my social worker lens to city council um, to make sure that we're building people-centered solutions and a government that's accountable to our residents. Thank you, Candy. So to begin with our first question here, Denver will be voting on Initiative 300, an initiative to allow any individual to engage in activities such as resting and sheltering oneself in a non-obstructive manner in an outdoor public place. The Right to Survive initiative is premised on protecting the homeless from city-mandated property seizures and camping bans that leaves officers confiscating property in all kinds of weather conditions. This is a city-authorized police action which leaves the, which leaves the unhoused facing any adverse health outcomes, including and up to death, and which also deprives them of personal property. Do you support 300? If not, or if so, which other areas of our city resources should be mobilized to support our unhoused populations? We'll start with you, Albus. 
Yeah, so thank you for the question. And I do not support 300. Uh, simply put, we as a city should be responsible for those who um, in this city who are most vulnerable. Um, I believe in a housing first model, and that's why we in District 9 have built more homeless housing than any other part of our city. I believe in making sure that we have mental health services for our, uh, our folks here, and that's why I support it, um, caring for Denver. Right now, we are getting in the city of Denver 1,000 folks off of the street every year and into housing. We need to double those efforts. For everyone who is passionate about what's happening to our homeless population, we need to put together a sustainable funding source to fund a housing solution uh, for our homeless folks. So I do not support 300 at all. I think that we need to put our support behind housing solution and housing first solutions, which we've done in this city. The other thing we need to do is hold our federal government accountable because they have totally ripped out our safety net programs. And that's why cities all over this country, as I talk to mayors and city council all over this country, they're struggling. They're in a crisis with our homeless situation because there is not enough housing. Thank you, Alex. Do you have a rebuttal, Candy? Only my response. Yes. So I support 300, and I think that context and history are really important when having this conversation. My opponent here actually sponsored the camping ban years ago, which was really what has catalyzed Initiative 300 now in 2019. The camping ban basically made it illegal to be homeless in the city of Denver. And so to criminalize poverty in that way, while at the same time not investing in solutions to ensure housing is available to all who want it and need it is a problem. Um, I support any community that tries to solve their own problems and all citizen-led ballot initiatives are that people taking it into their own hands to solve their problems. I think that the solutions um, Councilman Brooks talks about, they're, they're very far away from what is actually needed. Uh, we can't rely on the federal government. When we talk about history and the way that ho public housing was concentrated and the racism connected to redlining, we have to understand that the federal government failed us a long time ago with the way that they've addressed housing, housing poor people, housing people of color, and we can't expect them to get it right, especially under the current administration. So I think as a city, we have a heavier responsibility to do more. The linkage fee that we're using right now to build affordable housing um, is wildly insufficient. You can buy rolls of fabric for more than we're charging developers. And so I think we need to shift the context and the responsibility and make sure that corporations are carrying their fair share of this burden of growth that we're experiencing here in Denver. Thank you, Candy. Do you have a rebuttal? Yes. Uh, first, I think it's important to understand that um, this camping ordinance um, was, was something to make sure that we were getting folks into services, into the housing uh, that they need. Uh, there's only one person up here who's actually put um, and built and invested and passed legislation to make sure that we get people in the housing, and it's me. And so we have very, very clear, um, poignant, uh, projects that we can point to to see, show how we are helping folks, how we are putting together very complex financing options to make sure folks are housed, not only housed, but make sure they have jobs, putting together the first jobs program ever in Denver's history, Denver Works. And so those are things that we've been working on. We want to see folks be a part of the success of Denver and not be limited by it. Candy, you had something that you wanted to address. Yes. Um, so the camping ban was not a solution and to tell people without a home to move along without pro providing a place for them to move along to is it's a failure of city government and to understand that we have shelters that are not 24 7 we have to do something with our homeless population even in the day when they're not able to go into shelters and spend their time doing sleeping or whatever it is that our city believes shelters provide. I think the wraparound services that Councilman Brooks talks about are aspirational. We haven't gotten there yet. Really quick, I think that- uh, can, I, can I just rebuttal that? Cause I mean, we can. Really quick, <laughs> your opening statement, you said, Mr. Brooks, that we should have a housing first approach. Yeah. And you also said that we should put together a funding source, but we already have one, which is 
uh, $150 million over 10 years, started in 2017. The Canby ban itself is saying that people don't have a right to rest, stop, relax, and people have claimed that it's going to create tent cities or whatnot, mm -hmm. but the actual language of the text says that it can't be obstructive, right, non-obstructive. Uh, my question is, housing first? Yes, please. Let's figure out how to get people into houses, but until we have those houses built, you said that uh, District 9 has created the most affordable housing. How long does it take to do that? And at the same time, District 9 has the largest unhoused population. That's right. Be you know, District 9 has the largest homeless population because we have poor urban planning. Uh, we concentrated our poverty in this city, and that was wrong, right? Um, everywhere over this, this country, national policy shows us that when we invest in homeless services, we need to do that citywide. But we have a NIMBY attitude in this city, and we need to acknowledge that. Number one, housing takes time. I believe in transitional housing. That's what we're doing. Nothing is aspirational here. We just passed a solution center in Sunnyside. 60 days, or 30 days, folks can be in there at 60 people. Those who have been going to jail for urinating in public and things like that, they are now going into the solution center where they're getting services. They're being connected to opportunities. And so we don't speak aspirations. We speak facts. What I'm saying is we need to invest more. We do not have a sustainable funding source for homeless housing. We have a housing fund that is not adequate for homeless housing. We, a third of that goes to homelessness. We're going to move on to our next question on racial inequality. A few facts. Colorado had the most extensive KKK networks west of the Mississippi through the 1930s. The grandson of one ran for governor this year. Uh, last year. Educational equity has failed ch children of color based on zip code. Mm. Gentrification continues unabated. According to the Denver Gentrification Study 2016, gentrification is premised on a view of our communities as profit margin instead of community. The Colorado Trust tied historic segregation to modern gentrification. Addressing the racial wealth gap in Colorado specifically, they said the latest view of racial and income, uh, income inequality in the U.S. shows deep and entrenched disparities along racial lines. How does it play out in Colorado? Not well. Across a range of measures, Colorado was failing to provide equitable opportunities across racial lines. Colorado was third in the nation for white supremacist propaganda. White terrorists and right-wing violence are the biggest threat to Americans, yet people of color suffer the brunt of policing. Uh, Candy C. Tabaka, what are your thoughts on racial equality and equity, and how will you work to move District 9, and by extension Colorado, towards a more equal and equitable racial future? So I think right now, um, a lot of what we're experiencing with our city's changes um, is deeply rooted in that racism you talked about. We have policies that have never been designed to serve uh, people of color and poor people in this city. And so when we look at the way that our neighborhoods are changing, it's very easy to almost erase completely people of color in this city. And there's not a lot of pushback on that because we've branded our growth as um, natural or improving areas, even though we know that it's modern manifest destiny. And not only are higher income people pushing out people of color because of historical advantage when it comes to wealth, but we also know that our government is currently sanctioning violence and land theft from communities of color. With um, wealth building, the primary tool for wealth building is home ownership. We watched our city and our state collude to take over 5% of our homes in an 84% Latino neighborhood, homes that were owned. To, that, is a wealth, that is wealth in the brown community. We watched predatory lenders come in uh, really in an unfettered way, stealing properties from our black community in Five Points and Park Hill and Whittier, and that completely went ignored by our city. I think we need a consumer protections division that is making sure that there are not predatory practices that are stealing um, communities of color's ability to build wealth and to stay in this city. I also think that we need to implement or strengthen the pilot, the racial equity pilot. I think we're just a bit over time on that. I'm gonna have to ask uh, Councilman Brooks to respond. Yeah, I, I'm not really going to uh, respond to that. Some of the things Candy said uh, are warranted 
and good, but I want to be very factual. The Federal Housing Administration, when they did redlining in this uh, city, that is when gentrification started in the 40s, right? All over this country and in these cities, when banks said we will not lend to uh, people of color, black and brown, that's when it started in this community. And so I'm going to be uh, very factual of what I'm going to do because of it. I think this is all about economics. Um, and, and we come from, especially folks of color, uh, a very entrepreneurial, spirited people. And I want to set up um, an entrepreneurial center focused on black and brown uh, entrepreneurs in this city. We have never done that in the city. We've never called that out. We've never been unapologetic about it. We finally now have the opportunity to do it. The, the other thing that we did, we're doing right now is putting together the race and equity um, um, staff and trainings in our city and that's the thing that we need to start getting not just in the city but in our private sector we are we do not have equity in our private sector we do have issues within our um, police department as well but I believe that the use of force policy that we just set was one of the most progressive um, uh, in the country and that was because community leaders uh, in the community came together with the city to make sure uh, that that could be done Candy. My response to that is you're eight years into your leadership um, and we've lost significant ground. We've lost 11% of our home ownership amongst the black and brown community um, in your district. Can you tell me why eight years later you're only starting to think of how to protect black and brown wealth in our district? When I first got into office in 2011, a black business owner um, on Welton said to me, why does downtown have tax increment financing and we not have that? Why don't the black businesses along Welton have that? Immediately we begin to work on that. Now to this day, we have 60% black ownership on Welton. We have a majority of black small businesses on Welton. We are starting now to see the ecosystem. So we have been working on it, Candy. And 50 years of racist oppression takes more than eight years to take care of. This takes a lot more time and it takes collaboration of all of us working together to make sure that we're seeing equity in all of our communities of color. Just to be clear, the question was not just about gentrification but also about educational equity, yep. uh, white supremacist propaganda. There's a home in downtown that, I, that I've seen multiple times that has a sign that says skinhead parking only. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a broader topic than just gentrification. And to be fair, uh, Councilman Brooks, you have 243,000 dollars in donations, about 67,000 from developers. Uh, so it, it, it begs the question if dealing with gentrific gentrification is really something that you're going to tackle. Yeah, so um, the question was around why do you accept money from developers? Why do I accept money from um, uh, union folks and single moms and community members and even one of my opponents? Um, I have a grassroots to grass top supportive uh, system in, you know, for city council. But let's be clear, to build homeless housing, workforce housing, moderate income housing, you have to build. That takes development. That takes all types of individuals being a part of that. And I'm proud to say we've done that more than any other time in District 9 history. Candy, do you have a reply? So you recognize that 60% black ownership on Welton is a loss. Um, that Welton used to be 100% black owned. And so when we talk about TIFs and access to property now, you're also talking about it in a context where black and brown people have lost wealth mm -hmm. and have lost equity. Mm -hmm. And so when you're dreaming of entrepreneurship as the solution, um, you're missing the fact that you need capital, you need equity, to start something. Mm -hmm. And when we have lost our equity, when we have lost our connections, how do you do that? Is the city going to provide that? So we'll have to hold that question and move on to the next one. Oh, no, she can't put me out. I'm ready to go. Come on, baby. We got All right. a certain All amount right. of time per question. All I'm right. sorry. All right. I just got to make sure we're Continue the conversation. April is sex Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Mm. Start with a few facts here. One in five women and one in seven men in the United States have been raped at some time in their lives. 42% of victims experience their first completed rape before the age of 18. 
A 2016 survey found that 28% of CU Boulder's female undergrads had been sexually assaulted. CU is in the news now for a recent rape. Denver's DA, Beth McCann, was found in 2018 to have prosecuted 33% of rape cases, only a small improvement over her predecessor's average of 30%. The Denver Post rape tracker shows that Denver has had 185 sexual assaults reported so far this year, which is an average of 54.1 per month. That's 1.8 per day which is up from 122 when we began this debate series. The most rapes in any neighborhood in Denver has had, has had this year is in five points mm -hmm. with 16, which is up from, the, fr up from nine. For the district, that's approximately 7.7 .7 rapes per 100 residents. 1,000 residents. 1,000 residents. The average number of rapes per neighborhood this year is 2.37, which is up from 1.56 just a few weeks ago. These numbers are staggering, and the number of rapes just since we began these debates. How will you use your seat on the council to address these issues and make Colorado a safer place for women and female identified bodies? We'll start with you, Candy. Rape culture um, starts at the top, and rape is really about dominance, power, and control. And we've watched, um, not only at the federal level, but here at the local level, we've watched our administration uh, feed into this rape culture. When we don't protect women against discrimination or harassment, we, we exacerbate or perpetuate rape culture. And even as a woman running for office, you know, the, the threat of rape is unique in a campaign for a woman. Uh, our council person here, his campaign manager, fed into rape culture in our campaign because I was threatened uh, with rape and murder on a Facebook thread, and their campaign actually went searching in that camp in that thread for volunteers in a thread full of rape threats and death threats. And so when we talk about uh, rape culture in the city of Denver and protecting women in this city, we need to be able to hold systems accountable. We need to be able to make sure that at the top, from the very top down, um, we have people who understand what is harassment, what is rape, and we have an ability to hold them accountable. Right now in the police department, um, we need to be able to require <coughs> police to go through training, all city staff to go through training. The city attorney needs to operate independently and not serving the mayor. And we need to make sure that we shift the hyper-masculine culture of all of our levels of government here locally. Thank you, Candy. Councilman Brooks, please. Yeah, first, first I want to address this. Uh, number one, this is, to this is atrocious. It's totally unacceptable. And especially, it's, it's not acceptable on a candidate. So um, Candy and I have talked. I, I apologize for those threats, those ridiculous threats that were coming nationwide from conservatives. And we don't know who it was. It's come to me before. But that's ridiculous. And, and my um, campaign manager had no ill intent in that. So let's just address that. Secondly, the news that you just gave me, that five points, has the most, is shocking to me um, and it's a big issue and I think we have tried to address this issue in, in meeting with our district attorney and meeting with um, bringing our attorney our own city attorney together and saying how do we begin um, to enforce these laws but more importantly change this culture I have two daughters Kenya and Kaya right are the sweetest little things right and I want to make sure that they grow up in a culture of possibility of strength and not fear and that is what we're creating. And so um, I am 100% committed to making sure that we are developing um, and increasing the awareness and making sure that we're holding folks accountable who are entering into this horrible act. Just to push back on that a little bit, uh, regarding the mayor's misconduct while you were council president, you refused uh, an investigation claiming that any further investigation, uh, to further investigate this matter without uh, Detective Branch Wise's uh, request or consent would be contrary to best practices and risk revictimizing her. Uh, yeah, so that's that's a, this is a common mix, misconception. So the president of city council um, meets with all of city council, um, and and as you know, when we met, uh, we're not a, 
able to talk about everything that we were able to see. But all 13 members, uh, because of the laws that is on the books, that a elected official cannot, um, you know, cannot be uh, accused by a staff person or accused by a city-owned person. We've changed. We since changed that law. Now, elected officials can be. But at that time, we could not be in all 13. Everybody who disagreed on city council agreed that we did not have the authority to investigate the mayor at that time. So I want to be very clear about that. Did you personally make any statement regarding the mayor about how he should maybe step down or be held liable in another area, apart from your role as the president of the council? As the president of the council, um, I'm supposed to bring the council together and make a decision and make a vote. We, we did that. I then told the mayor he needs to make a public statement of apology and deal with this matter. Mr. DeBaca? I think apologies are not enough and that's why representation matters. When we talk about a documented uh, harassment from the highest level of our government here locally, we have a platform and a responsibility to advocate for women in every office in this city and what that means is that with the proof that we had, it was enough proof to ask the mayor to resign. And I believe that as council president, that's what should have been asked. The fact that our books literally do not allow us to hold our mayor accountable is a problem. And that is the type of thing that we need to change in this city. It's not acceptable. And to make a statement of apology is not enough. It doesn't protect the next woman. It actually allows the, pers the perpetrator to do it again and just know that the way to correct it is with an apology, which is not enough. We did correct it. The legislative branch uh, made sure that every elected official can be held accountable by a staff person. We directed the executive branch to do that. We directed uh, the clerk and recorder and the judicial branch to do that as well. And so um, that was change. And we want to make sure that the next woman does not have that issue. Regarding the uh a statistic that Beth McCann has only been able to prosecute 33% of rape cases, 30% 30, uh, 30 was her predecessor's rate. Uh, where is the failure between mm -hmm. law enforcement, collection of evidence, and prosecution, and how do we support women in, in, in being able to prosecute and hold perpetrators fully accountable? Candy. There are breakdowns at every level there. Um, just because we allow it to have, um, now it's new policy to allow council members elected to be held um, accountable for harassment. There's no real way to do it. When you have a mayor who's appointing the head of all of these agencies and HR, if you're an employee in the city, you're not gonna feel empowered to go and tell somebody when you're being harassed by a person in a position of power. And then when you're a person who does go to police and police dismiss it or don't understand the severity of it or ask you to confront your harasser without a mediator, um, there are breakdowns at every level that decrease the likelihood of it being taken seriously and then prosecuted effectively. To, to answer your question uh, directly, I think we need to go in and look and do an analysis and evaluation of what um, uh, Director uh, McCann uh, and the difference is between her and the last district attorney. I think um, there may be some issues. Uh, um, uh, Beth McCann um, is looking at, uh, you know, justice reform and all these other issues. And I think we need to look at that. And because there may be a fear of um, not, you know, making sure, sure folks are penalized at the greatest degree. And so um, there's some things, analysis that needs to go in. Absolutely. Let's move on to the next question. Community wellness. Uh, according to denverpublichealth.org's City Council District Report for District 9, life expectancy in your district is 75.4 uh, and 76.4 years, 3.2 to 2.2 years shorter than Denver overall. Mm -hmm. uh, differences in life expectancy between districts show that place matters. 21% mm -hmm. of District 9 young adults, uh, 18 to 24, use tobacco, 4% higher than Denver overall. 17% of public school children aged 2 through 17 in District 9 uh, are obese, 1% higher than Denver overall. 14% of District 9 adults have been diagnosed with depression, which is common across all districts at 13%. Denver.gov states that the health of a community depends on more than access to health care. 
Healthy communities are composed of our physical environment, healthy opportunities, support, and where individuals easily connect with community partners, healthy food systems, and safe environments. Increased access to those items allows individuals of a healthy community to thrive. It should be noted that District 9 is the only district we've seen so far that has a deficit in each of these areas. Mm -hmm. Do you believe District 9 is serving this community equitably in these areas? And if not, what will you do to address disparities in the district? Mr. Brooks, you were first elected District 8 in 2011, ran for District 9 in 2015 due to redistrict redistricting. This means you've had almost a decade to address this issue. Let's start with you. Yeah, I think this is a great question and something I've been working on um, my entire career. And at the beginning, um, we started off fast. Um, we got a chance to open up a Sprouts on Colfax, uh, which hired uh, our black and brown young folks from East High School and uh, took food stamps. Uh, but we, we, we saw immediately how hard it was to open up grocery stores in our part of the district. Um, and I think access to healthy food is one of the most important things. And so we, we believe you can do that from a micro to macro uh, um, um, opportunities. And so macro, we're doing that now. Um, we got an, a, a new um, grocery store opening up on, in, in the cold neighborhood right next to GES in the Five Points neighborhood as well. Um, and that's good, but it just takes so long. So you have to empower our corner stores. You have to empower um, our, our, our smaller co-op stores and start looking at different mat matters like that. The other thing I say is um, that I've been a champion over um, making sure um, tobacco is not getting in the hands of our young people all over our district. Um, but this is one of the reasons I ran, and this is things that I'm going to be fighting for and continue fighting for and have shown success in. Um, but we've got to continue fighting, and we've got to understand what we're up against as well. Andy. Um, I, I've worked on this a lot. Uh, social determinants of health are only now being recognized as uh, things that impact physical health and well-being. We didn't even make the top 500 cities, healthiest cities in the country, and that's <clears> a shame <throat> when we're talking about being the most livable or desirable city. Um, we started the Healthy Block Captains program, and we've been trying to address these social determinants of health in community, but it doesn't matter if you put a grocery store in a neighborhood that people can't afford. And so we talk a lot about the impact of poverty um, and root shock, which is related to displacement. Uh, we also are missing the whole conversation about government sanctioned violence against community. And so in District 9, we have the most polluted zip code in America. We have um, the, a disproportionate concentration of the marijuana industry in our neighborhoods. We have every major regional freight or highway line. We have allowed CDOT to triple the size of a highway through neighborhoods that we know causes 70% higher rates of asthma, cancer, de uh, cardiovascular death and disease. And we are not even addressing the air pollution that is coming with a lot of the construction that's forcing semis to idle through neighborhoods. And so when we talk about social determinants of health, we have to also talk about the impact of land use and zoning because those are ways that the city has participated in creating unhealthy communities in our area. I think another um, thing that we have not seen in our community but since I've been at City Council, every park um, in the Northeast Denver community has been redone and connected to the community like never before. Matter of fact, we have actually uh, expanded our park system, which is incredibly important in urban neighborhoods um, by 60 acres. And so I think that there are other um, opportunities that we're starting to see in our community that are beginning to work. Yes, we have a highway that is very difficult, an issue that has been in our community for over 60 years, but we're making that highway pay into our community and do community benefits that you are a part of. We are fighting um, some of our marijuana shops that are opening up, up that you are with me on fighting. And so we are fighting for the health of, and, and the opportunity and security of our future with our young people. But we need to continue to do that and we need to come together to make sure that there is a clear strategic plan of how to do that well for all of our students. We have a few seconds left, Candy, if you wanted to have something to say. Correction, Add. park space is actually shrinking. Um, and correction, we are fighting and you have not represented us well in those fights. We've 
not gotten what CDOT has taken for our community. In fact, we almost gave them 46th Avenue for free when they were taking over $21 million worth of housing. That was, that was identified in a city commission study and we let them off the hook paying only $2 million back into housing. We're out of time. Uh, we have an audience question here. Uh, Along the, along the lines of what we're talking about. In the areas surrounding I-70, Swansea, uh, Illyria, and Globeville families have been subject to multi-generation health effects from living near two highways within a Superfund site. Is tripling the footprint of I-70 and lowering the viaduct through these neighborhoods in a, in, in a floodplain and largely unremediated Superfund site the best solution? As well as, do you support Central 70 alternative I-270, I-76 bypass around these neighborhoods and the restoration of 46th Avenue as a boulevard. Yeah, so no, that's not the best solution, but it's the solution that we have. And here's why. If we don't touch that viaduct, we lose 80, the $800 million in bridge loan funds. If we move, lose the $800 million, we don't have opportunity to build a highway, right? The other issue is, uh, not here with me, but I can call Joe Salazar, Representative Joe Salazar, and all the other commissioners who say moving a highway from one poor neighborhood to a poorer neighborhood is not the answer. And so we are stuck in this um, situation of I-70. And what I did was, when in my leadership, and living nine blocks away from here with my three kids and my wife, is saying, we need to make sure we get the largest community benefits agreements in CDOT history. And that's what we're getting today, over $30 million. Does it make up for all the years and all the issues? No, but it's making sure that there's an investment into our community and that's what we're gonna get. Candy? So it is absolutely not the best solution and we've fought against this option for many years. I don't think that we need to chase this option because of the bridge fund. Um, <clears throat> that bridge fund, the, the entire state of Colorado will be paying 50% of the entire state's bridge fund for the next 35 years for two miles in highway, of highway in Denver. That is tripling the pollution in our city, in our state. Um, the, the proposed reroute that we had identified um, is not moving it from one poor neighborhood to another. The impact is 18 to 1 where it is at and where we were proposing that it would be. Where we were proposing that it would be would only add a minute and a mile and a half to a commuter's drive and it would help us to take down the bridge and restore the 46th Avenue as a parkway with trees that would mitigate the pollution that has been in that community for a long time. I still and always will pr promote the reroute and I don't think it's too late for us to course correct right now. We have 20 seconds left. I think we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next question. <laughs> on local media, a topic near our hearts. Uh, media is in crisis in Colorado. Denver Open Media, our host, this evening is under attack as Mayor Hancock has worked to defund this important public access media project and remove equipment. The Denver Post and the Daily Camera, uh, our region's only two major print newspapers, are owned by hedge funds who are busy extracting capital and laying off staff. Fake news is the slur of the day, thanks to our president. How do we support our local newspapers, community journalism, and organizations like Denver Open Media that work to be a pillar of community information and provide equal access, educational programs, and media training to everyone? Candy. Um, I think that the mayor's defunding of DOM is indicative of uh, the, what he's trying to create, and that is a smoke screen so that there is no accountability and transparency in this city. Um, even with Denver Post, yes, they're run by hedge funds, but the, but the city of Denver actually leases their space. So we create multiple layers of, of conflict and barriers to real accountability and transparency. And I think that we should be doing the opposite and putting aside funds to make sure that we have support, that we are supporting true journalism, factual-based journalism, so that we're not making our decisions based off of fake news and based off of the narrative hedge funds want to shape for our city and and the narrative that actually benefits um, the crony capitalist in this city 
I 100% support open media and have been supporting open media for the last uh, three years in this city. Here's the issue. Um, we're on the legislative side. We do not control the budget. Um, we have influence and not authority. And we have been pushing the mayor's administration to make sure that they completely fund Open Media Foundation. Here's the value that I believe I have and other um, leaders in the city have. We need as much connection and open media um, sources in the city um, so that folks begin to get the information. We just had a meeting last night around passing our 2040 uh, comprehensive plan. And we had all of these meetings and I talked about the lack of participation and even notification that people got. Media sources and, and, and open media opportunities allow folks and connect folks to what's going on in government. And so I'm 100% supportive and will continue to fight for sources like Open Media Foundation to make sure that they're completely funded and they do have the resources. So you made a reference to what sounded like outsourcing power, right? City, the city council has a certain amount of power. Mayor's office has different power. Those yeah. things don't always overlap, but there has to be checks and balances. That's right. uh, more and more power has actually shifted to the mayor's office in recent years. Is that a failure of the current city council to hold the I mayor accountable or specify, is there not? Specify what power has shifted. Well, I mean, specifically, uh, the mayor's office has taken uh, public access media and shifted it into, how does that work? That's, that's always been under the executive branch. So maybe, maybe you could say, because uh, uh, Councilwoman uh, Ortega talks about this a lot, um, you know, when we review some of our bills, we don't do them on two readings anymore, we do them on one reading. Um, maybe that's some of the power that we've lost. But I don't believe that we've lost power um, as city council. This is a strong mayor form of government. Um, and if we want that government to change, that's a larger charter conversation that we need to have with the city, the people of the city of Denver. But we and this city um, on city council feel like we are leading the values of this city. It was us who brought the affordable housing fund to the city. It was us who, who brought the, the Immigrant Rights and Opportunities Act to the city. It was us who did all of those things. And so I believe there is str strength in city council and I believe there is power and vision and how we want to see the city run. So to answer your question, it was 2018, the uh, Denver Department of Marketing and Media Services under Mayor Hancock moved control of Denver's public access channels to the city, resulting in what could arguably be called uh, the city co-opting control of media and content from the public. Um, that runs the gambit of where Donald Trump is talking about having his own public access network because of fake news. Yeah. Uh, Candy, your response? I, it's more <coughs> of a response to what Councilman Brooks shared. I, I feel confused by the way he frequently brushes off responsibility onto the mayor and tells us that some of the barriers to his success have been mayoral control, but then on the other hand tells us that he believes that the mayor and the city are upholding the values of this city. Um, it's also frustrating on the campaign trail to show up at events that are hosted for Mayor Hancock and their dual events with Councilman Brooks. They fund their staffers together, they fund their campaign people on the streets, their canvassers together. And so are you displeased with the mayor? Are you supportive of the mayor? Is the mayor really a barrier to your success or are you guys colluding for the same reasons? I, I'm so glad I have this cup around facts um, because I wanna, I wanna just set, <laughs> I don't even understand what was just asked to me. Uh, number one, um, I never have said that the mayor takes away any of our success as city council. The budget I've, I've, is I've, I've never said that. I, but I always try and educate um, folks to understand what the legislative branch is and what the executive branch is, what we have authority over and what we have influence over. The mayor's uh, staff does not cross over with city council staff. The mayor's campaign does not cross over with um, my campaign. We don't share dollars at all. Mm. And so anyway, that's, I, I, I think it's, I, that's what I wanna be clear for folks so that they understand um, the difference. But I do want to say I am very proud of the last two to three years, especially when I was president and now as Jolin is president, of how council has used its authority as the body. We are no longer operating as individuals, 
but as the body. And we're getting some of the most progressive um, values done in this city that the city has been asking for. Okay, great. So we're going to start the lightning round now. Uh, the first question is, Denver is unveiling a new transportation department to supersede RTD in the city. Are you for or against it? For. Councilman. For. Denver is home to the nation's most polluted zip code. Transition Denver to fully renewables by 2030 or sooner. Yes or no? Sooner, yes. Sooner, yes. Denver is voting on decriminalizing mushrooms. The psilocybin initiative legalized mushrooms. Yes or no? Yes. Councilman. Yes. State Representative Julie Gonzalez has proposed removing the ban against rent control to allow cities to decide for themselves what works best to support lower income renters. If the ban removal passes, would you support rent control in Denver? Yes. Yes. Do you support deferred action for childhood arrivals, DACA, yes or no? Yes. Yes. The Olympics initiative prohibiting the use of public monies, resources, etc in connection with any future Olympic Games without the city first obtaining voter approval, for or against? For. For. April 10th was Equal Pay Day. The Equal Pay for Equal Work Act was recently heard in committee. Do you support a law to ensure equal pay, yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. Ban fracking in Colorado, yes, yes. or no? Ban, to Ban fracking in Colorado. Oh. Um, mm. That's a no. No, it's not a no. It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a no it's for me. now. It's a no for now. No for now. Okay. Democracy for the People Act would ban corporations and other entities from donating directly to candidates, lower contribution limits, and create matching funds, officially bringing campaign finance reform to Denver and blunting the impact of money in politics. Do you support 2E, yes or no? We already have it, yes. I was an original signatory on that ballot initiative, yes. Finally, ending with some important geopolitical entry. Who will win the Game of Thrones? Hopefully Snow. Jon Snow? Yes. You have no idea? No idea, bro. <laughs> Neither do we. Shame. Neither do we, but we're excited about it. I'm going to post. Uh, we have a little bit of time. Question two on racial inequality uh, was, was robust, and I believe you had a comment at the end that you wanted to oh, shoot. I don't, follow I don't up on. It. Where were we at? We had uh, talked about gentrification. We had talked about racism in the community. Uh, equity, we're talking about educational equity. Yeah, maybe it was educational. Yeah, so, you know, I think um, the school to prison pipeline is, is something to me that is probably the most important civil rights issue of our time here in Northeast, in Northeast Denver. Um, you know, my young kids going to school in in Denver Public School, I see firsthand uh, the school to prison pri pipeline. If these, if our students are not ready by the third grade, um, if they're not proficient in, in reading and writing and mathematics, there's 95 percent chance of going to jail um, and, and, and not graduating high school. And so um, I think it's imperative, number one, um, that we start deeply working with our new superintendent, Susanna Cardova, working with our school board, but starting to see the change and making sure that if we are not seeing change from our third grade folks of color, black and brown, um, that there would be issues, like we would uh, be addressing them, and I need to see the bar moving. And so we have not seen the bar moved. I'm, I'm deeply concerned about it. If it does not move, we are in trouble as a city. I can tell you exactly where we would be as a city in the next 20 years if we do not start seeing uh, young folks of color uh, close the achievement gap in the city. Andy? That's something I've spent most of my career addressing and DPS in the last 10 years with the privatization of our public schools has become more segregated and the um, equity gap has grown. And so I think we need to revisit what choice means in Denver and we need to seriously start talking about how inappropriate it is to have more than 40% of our school portfolio being privatized. Um, we also have to have some accountability for upper level management in DPS. There's virtually none right now. And so, yes, we, we need to address the system, but it's a full ecosystem conversation. And the segregation is a big piece of it because choice is not really choice um, in our neighborhoods right now. Any final thoughts on that topic? We got a lot of work to do. <laughs> a lot yeah. of work to do. I would, uh, love, I would love to also see um, the school system 
or the city filling a gap where we're partnering with unions um, because we're not doing that well right now. And so there's not a lot of alternative pipelines into careers um, sure. outside of Emily Griffith and Emily Griffith is not doing what we could do as a city. So there are a lot of ancillary points that I would love to make, but I don't think we have enough time, but really quick thoughts on uh, police in our schools. It, it became a thing after Columbine, which was here, but at the same time, police <coughs> in schools tend to just create a system, you mentioned the school to prison pipeline. Uh, another topic, uh, you're hoping Susanna Cordova is successful. There were calls for her to step down and resign during the DPS strikes because of some lawyers working on her husband's behalf yeah. without disclosure. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so much going on in, in how we support our mm -hmm. students. Those two topics, I don't know. Um, DPS in many regards is a worse mess right now. Uh, and I feel like the, the privatization conversation is really what was, uh, what made the superintendent promotion controversial. Her husband works on the financing of the privatization of schools and DPS. I think that the city does have a role to play with the intergovernmental agreements that put police in schools. There, there is state legislation that, governments, that governs that IGA, but DPS and, DP, and the city of Denver could end that agreement to have DPD in schools because they're not in all schools. They're primarily in black and brown schools. And so I would love to see that contract ended and I would love to see DPS and the city reconvene <coughs> their um, group that they used to have many years ago that worked together collaboratively on the issues of education that related um, to the city of Denver. Yeah, you know, when it comes to uh, police officers in school, it's a, it's a very tough subject for me. I mean, especially being um, a, a black man that um, and, and young black men in this school are targeted more than anybody else in DPS. And so I think um, here's the issue. Um, I have some hope because of the use of force policy that has been going on in, with DPD. Uh, we have seen because of use of force and the trainings a decrease of use of force of folks of color in the city in the last six months. Can there be special training and special individuals to go into the school and not your typical police officers. That police officers that are in the school right now are older, they're assigned, it's, it's almost a cush job, and they are not dealing with the students in a proper way. So that's something I wanna look at. Susanna Cardova is the superintendent. Um, there is not going to be a coup, so we have to work with her. I agree with her decision to take on uh, Dr. Antoine Jefferson and start to do an evaluation and analysis of everything that's going on with our black and brown kids. I believe that partnership could be very powerful, but she has to make sure to give him power to do the things that he needs to do to make the decisions. Excellent. I think uh, at this point, we're gonna wrap up with final statements from our candidates. I believe we began with Mr. Brooks. So, Ms. Tidabaka, you first. Yeah, I mean, this is our last debate and we're two weeks away from the election and democracy is for the people who show up and claim it. In a city where we have less than 26% of our general population voting and lower in our district, less than 18%, it's really important for us to step up and show up for ourselves and our community now and make sure that we vote, uh, make sure that we pick up our neighbor's bo uh, ballots and get those turned in. Every person in the city of Denver can drop off 10 ballots and um, get people registered to vote. I'm tired of hearing that a rising tide lifts all boats. It's very clear that for poor people and people of color in this city, it has not lifted our boat. It has tipped our boat over and we're drowning and it's time for us to do something about it. And so I hope to earn your support. My track record is there and is available for all to see. I've proven where I stand. I stand with community. I will always put people over profit and we'll do that as your councilwoman. So um, I wanna thank uh, the moderators and thank Candy. Um, I think it takes a lot to run for office and I just admire people's passion to be out here working hard uh, for the community. Um, I've been doing this uh, a while and I'm excited. I feel like I have the vision and the experience um, to take District 9 to that place that we're looking for. And, and what's that place? Um, folks are concerned about the growth. Folks are concerned about 
um, the haves and have nots. I've been at the doors all over this district and that is a big concern of folks and it's a concern of mine. It's a concern um, uh, when I helped my good friend Sherrod get out of jail um, that he was connected to services. It's, it is a concern of mine that he is connected to the success of this city and I am not the leader that's going to say we need to cut off the success of the city. I think that's ridiculous. I have leaders that live in Detroit that tell you what that looks like. I want to harness the success of the city to make sure that all are a part of it and that's, the, that's why we're doing the work of making sure our formerly homeless folks, our, our former, formerly felons are getting connected to jobs and services and opportunities. You, I would love to have your voice and I hope you support the leader that has proven that they can listen, legislate, and lead in this city, in this complex environment. Um, and I have been accountable um, in this city, and I'll continue to work hard for this city. Um, this city means a ton to me um, because my kids are gonna be raised in this city. They're gonna, they're gonna grow up here. Um, they're gonna be here for the next 20 years. And so uh, I would love to have your support as your District 9 City Councilman, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Brooks. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Candy Stadabaka. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us tonight and sharing your thoughts and ideas uh, with Denver's about around Denver's most pressing issues. Uh, we wish you the best during your race. Um, and to the audience, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, remember that uh, you hold the, you hold the power to to change and make change in your community. So definitely get out there and vote. Your voice and your vote do matter. Um, we'd also like to thank Denver Open Media and uh, the Open Media Foundation as well as Civic Matters for hosting tonight's event. Um, I'm Sarah Moore. And I'm De La Vaca. Thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful evening.